Okay, so this is a continuation of the ethics of belief. We're discussing William James now. We saw that William, uh, W.K. Clifford uh, believes that it, it's never okay to believe on insufficient evidence, and we'll see that William James thinks that it's sometimes okay to believe on insufficient evidence, and in particular in the case of religion. And so Clifford thinks that, you know, uh, one would never have sufficient evidence for belief in certain things like religion, and, and um, William James is going to say, uh, that doesn't matter. It's still okay to believe in religion. So let's just set aside uh, for these lectures whether there's good evidence for one particular religion or, or not, whether there's good evidence for God's existence. I get into that later on uh, when we talk about arguments for and against God's existence. For now, we're just going to consider setting aside the evidence whether uh, it's okay to believe anything on insufficient evidence. Right. And the main question is, is it ever OK to believe something without sufficient evidence? And you have this person taking a leap of faith, basically. So William James, he wrote this piece called The Will to Believe. And, you know, he lived in the 1800s. And it, this was a direct response to W.K. Clifford. And he's an American psychologist and philosopher. His claim is that it's sometimes permissible, even obligatory to believe without sufficient evidence. So in order to get his view on the table, we need to give some definitions. And these definitions are particular to James, so we need to keep them in mind as we uh, go through the lecture. Hypothesis, anything that may be proposed to our beliefs or belief. So something that you can believe, a statement basically, that you can assent to. The sun will rise, water is H2O, God exists, these are all hypotheses. They are uh, things that we can believe in, according to William James. And some hypotheses are live, some are dead. Uh, live hy hypothesis is one which appeals as a real possibility to him to whom it is proposed. And this is going to be relative to the person, whether a hypothesis is live or not. Uh, the earth is flat versus the sun will rise. For me, the claim that the earth is flat is a dead hypothesis that I can't even envision myself believing that. Um, of course, I'm open to the evidence, but it looks pretty clear like the earth is round, right? Uh, the sun will rise. That's a live hypothesis for me. And in fact, one that I accept, the sun will rise tomorrow, for example. So a live hypothesis is one that we can sort of... Uh, conceive of ourselves believing um, given our current context something like that so when William James is actually giving um, this as a talk a lecture in front of sort of uh, you know Protestant uh, students Protestant Christian students so for them he says here's a live hypothesis Christianity is true and maybe even agnosticism is true those are both live hypotheses for them they can you know, there are real possibilities for, for those students say, to, to believe that God exists or to believe that God doesn't exist or, or maybe even that we don't know that God exists. Okay, so it's going to depend on the context and the person. And an option is a decision between two hypotheses. For example, go out with an, go out with an umbrella or go out with an umbrella or without. So take your umbrella or not. Um, so this is a, an option, okay? And a living option is a decision between two hypotheses that have both have some appeal, be an agnostic or a Christian, okay? Uh, a living option is a decision. You're making a decision between two hypotheses. Do I, be a, do I become a Christian? Do I become an agnostic? Um, and both of them, you know, you, you can decide between them. A forced option is being forced to choose between options. Okay, being forced to choose. Basically, there are only two options in such a case, right? If you have more than two options, it's not forced. Believe it or not. Okay, that's forced because there are only two options, logically speaking. Uh, stay inside or take your umbrella out with you when you go. Okay, that's not forced because you have other options. You can take your umbrella out with you when you go, or you can leave your umbrella and go out, or you can stay and open your umbrella in the house, 
or you can stay without your umbrella. So there are at least four options and there are many more, but uh, the point is it's not forced because there are more than two options. Okay, so believe Christianity or not, that's a forced option. And a momentous option is a unique opportunity or or one that has a lot riding onto it, a significant opportunity. Okay, come to the North Pole with me. If you have a friend who's going to nor the North Pole and wants to pay your way, I mean, unless you have a lot of resources and uh, time, this probably would be a unique opportunity for you. If you let this go, you may not ever have the chance to go to the North Pole again. Um, or a significant opportunity, for example, uh, the opportunity to, uh, say, invest in a certain stock at a certain time um, where um, professionals are saying it looks like this stock is just it's going to rally. You know, it's going to it's going to go up significantly in a short amount of time. OK, so that would be maybe momentous, but it's, that one's not necessarily unique. So momentous, I think, maybe is broader than unique. OK, so we've got these definitions. Let's try to keep them in mind as we go. An initial problem, uh, because th th think of the title, the will to believe, deciding to believe uh, that you can. It is permissible for you to choose to believe a certain thing. Well, an initial problem is this. Can our will actually modify our beliefs? Can we will to believe something? I challenge you right now to believe that Abraham Lincoln is a myth. You can't do it unless you're, you know, you're a, um, a Lincoln mythicist or something, um, or to believe that the dollar in your pocket is actually $100. You can't do it. You can wish it to be true, but you can't believe it to be true. So then is it really the case that we can will to believe something? James says, it, yes. Sometimes it's not the case that we can, but sometimes it is the case that we can. So it is only our already dead hypotheses that our willing nature is unable to bring to life again. So, yeah, you can't believe that Abraham Lincoln is a myth because that's a dead hypothesis to you. Unless someone presents you with really compelling evidence that Abraham Lincoln never existed, you can't bring yourself to believe that he is a myth. However, according to James, for a life hypothesis, our will can impact our belief. For example, uh, say you are interested in a particular religion. Well, if you decide to go to the religious services of that religion, hang around people who believe in that religion, speak with them about religious matters, well, what you're doing is you're sort of willing yourself to be in a sort of situation in which you're more inclined to come to believe that the religion is true. If our will can impact our beliefs, should we exercise our will to change our beliefs? So even if we can, even if we can will ourselves to believe something, should we? Is there a difference between being able to and being permitted to, uh, say, morally speaking, or even rationally speaking? Okay, and James says yes that we should exercise our will to change our beliefs in certain cases. And here's his thesis. Our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. For to say under such circumstances, do not decide, but leave the question open is itself a passional decision just like deciding yes or no, and is attended with the same risk of losing the truth. Okay, there's a term in there that I haven't defined yet, a genuine option. This is a living, forced, and momentous option. And we'll see, we'll see this in further detail on the next slide. What he says is that we must, with our passional nature, decide between options when we can't decide by our intellect alone. So if our intellect leads us to a middle position of sort of agnosticism, we can, it is permissible when it's a genuine option, a genuine option only, to use our passional nature to make a decision. Because why? If you say in such circumstances, do not decide, but leave it open, that's a decision. It's just like deciding yes or no. And it's attended with the same risk of losing the truth. So if you 
Think of this. If you remain an agnostic on some issue, you lose the chance to believe the truth on the issue. If you stay an agnostic on an issue, you lose the, tran you lose the chance of believing the truth on that issue. So decide, to decide is a passional decision and to not decide is a passional decision. Either way, you're deciding, you're making a decision. So it's like a man in a snowstorm, right? For a, at least for a genuine option where he can go to the right or to the left. He's not sure. He knows one of the ways leads to civilization. It's either to the right or to the left, but he's not sure which way is which. And he says, I will not decide because I cannot determine it on intellectual grounds alone. I don't know if it's the town is to the right. I don't know if the town is to the left. So I will sit down in the snow and wait. Well, what's going to happen? He's in a snowstorm. He's going to die, right? So to sit down in the snow is to decide. And it's irrational, uh, at least in this case of the snowstorm, because, you know, because you're going to freeze to death. Better to risk, you know, sort of uh, believing the wrong thing or acting in the wrong way, in this case, for the chance of saving your life, than to most assuredly lose your life by deciding, you know, it's not just a, it's not just not deciding, it, it is deciding, deciding to sit down in the snow and not move. So, now Clifford Sorry, now James addresses Clifford. Believe nothing, Clifford tells us. Keep your mind in suspense forever, rather than by closing it on insufficient evidence, incur the awful risk of believing lies. You, on the other hand, may think that the risk of being in error is a very small matter when compared with the blessings of real knowledge, and be ready to be duped many times in your investigation rather than postpone indefinitely the chance of guessing true. I myself find it impossible to go with Clifford. So here he relays what Clifford says. Keep your mind in suspense forever. Rather than by closing it on insufficient evidence, you risk the awfulness of believing a lie. Then what he recommends to you is that, um, hey, better to risk being in error and grasp the truth than to stay in suspense forever, and lose the truth. So the skeptic, the one who's an agnostic, values avoiding error over losing the truth. Better to avoid belief than believe something false. And this is a sort of passional decision to place value in avoiding error over grasping the truth. Whereas the believer, you know, whether the atheist or the theist, belief that no God, belief that God, the believer seems to value believing the truth, the chance at believing the truth over avoiding error. Better to risk error than miss out on the truth. Okay, so they're going to believe, even if there's maybe not sufficient evidence, so that they have a chance of grasping the truth rather than guarantee that they would lose the truth by staying in suspense between two options. So, when is it permissible to exercise our wills in coming to a belief? Not in scientific matters, typically. The hypotheses are not living, forced, or momentous. As James says, seldom is there any such hurry about them, these scientific matters, that the risks of being duped by believing a premature theory need be faced. The questions here are always trivial. The hypotheses are hardly living. The choice between believing truth or false, falsehood is seldom forced. So how is it momentous? How is it momentous to believe that um, water is H2O, right? It's not a, it's not a sort of unique opportunity. Uh, believe it now or you lose out, right? So for the scientist, they can, they have the luxury. And for, for us, in regard to scientific beliefs, we have the luxury of sort of carefully weighing our options, waiting for more evidence, and maybe even forever just staying in suspense. Okay. 
However, there probably are some scientific truths that are momentous or that, that are genuine options, um, but typically they're, they're not. They're not living force or momentous. But there are two kinds of cases in which it's okay to believe without rational justification. For example, self-fulfilling beliefs. These are beliefs that create the fact that's belief. For example, believing that you will recover from an illness. So this increases the odds that you will recover. So by believing it, you help bring it about. Or believing that someone likes you. If, if you go, go, go to a date uh, skeptical about whether they will like you, thinking that they're going to you know, find you awkward or something, probably we're not going to go on a second date. Well, that's going to be likely going to be self-fulfilling, that your date is going to notice that you're acting in an awkward way, that you're insecure, that sort of thing, and won't necessarily, uh, it, it could be the case that they, they won't want to call you back or go out on a date with you again. But if you walk in confidently believing that they like you and that they would want to hang out with you, that's going to come off. Hopefully you're not overconfident so that you, 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 you know, you look sort of uh, cocky. Um, but coming in with the appropriate level of confidence uh, is going to help you out. It's going to help create the fact that the person likes you. And uh, so self-fulfilling beliefs are, he, he believes these are cases where you can believe on the basis of insufficient evidence. You know, you, the doctor tells you you have a 20% chance of living. You don't have sufficient evidence to believe you'll recover. Or someone you've never met, it's a blind date. You don't have enough evidence to believe they'll like you. But yet you do, and that helps create the fact that you're believing in. Two, genuine options. Here are cases where it's okay to believe without rational justification, where it's an option is living. That means it has some level of plausibility to you. You know, believe in Christianity, believe in, uh, you know, be an agnostic. It's forced. For example, with Christianity, believe it or not, you know, there's no third option. You either believe it or you don't. And then momentous. Uh, it's a unique opportunity or something significant rides upon it. Think about religion. Uh, God, God either exists or God doesn't exist. And, um, you know, let's go with the Christian view of things. Uh, there's heaven waiting for you if you believe and hell waiting for you if you don't believe. And so it's momentous. It's significant. Okay. All right. So morality and religion are two cases of uh, two areas of inquiry where there are genuine options. So this is um, an example of a self-fulfilling belief. I'll let you pause the slide here and read over that quote if you would like to. So what about morality? It's living, uh, uh, to living if the option of believing it and not believing it has some appeal. So believing that there is genuine right or wrong or believing that there's not, those options are going to be living for you if you're in this sort of right kind of the appropriate kind of frame of mind that, uh, for example, to, suppose you're taking an ethics course and and your strong moral intuitions tell you there is genuine right and wrong, but you're considering moral skepticism as a view where maybe they're, you're skeptical about um, there being any moral truths. Well, that's going to be a living option for you, and it's going to be forced. Believe in morals or don't. There are two options there. And then it's momentous because the stakes are significant. Imagine a person who lives, truly lives as if there is no right and wrong. Now, of course, they're going to want to avoid jail, probably. They're, they have the self-preservation instinct, but they're, if, they're, if they can get away with something, they'll do it. Versus the person who believes that there is a genuine right or wrong, they're going to be held accountable for what they do. Well, then they're probably more likely to act in accordance with that, or at least they're going to consider it uh, more seriously than the person who believes everything is okay. I could do whatever I want. So it is a living force momentous uh, option here. And then what about religion? It's living for the person if the person's evidence for or against religion is not sufficiently strong. So suppose you've considered some of the evidence for a particular relig religion and you're kind of in the middle. But, you know, believing or not believing has some level of possibility for you. Both of them do. Then it's a living option for you. It's forced. You can you either believe it or you don't. Right. And but. James says is we cannot escape the issue by remaining skeptical and waiting for more light. 
because although we do avoid error in that way if religion be untrue, we lose the good if it be true, just as certainly as if we positively choose to disbelieve. It's as if a man should hesitate indefinitely to ask a certain woman to marry him because he was not perfectly sure that she would prove an angel after he brought her home. Would he not cut himself off from that particular angel possibility as decisively as if he went and married someone else? Skepticism, then, is not avoidance of option. It is option of a certain particular kind of risk, the risk being better risk, lose, better risk, loss of truth than chance of error. That is your faith. Vetoer's exact position. Okay, so you do, you are forced to make a choice and it's momentous, the stakes are significant. We are supposed to gain even now by our belief and to lose by our non-belief a certain vital good. So even now we will gain a, a good by believing and in the future, in the afterlife, if it's true, then we would gain that good by believing. So in summary, W. K. Clifford, he holds to the principle that it is never permissible to believe on insufficient evidence, whereas James holds that it is sometimes permissible to do so. I'm curious to know, uh, what, would, what do you say and why? Uh, I look forward to reading your comments.